Well, as usual, I am psyched for tonight's program. We've got um, some great speakers who I'm really looking forward to learning from. And um, th this tonight's program is inspired by an exhibit that's on display at the Oregon Historical Society right now. It's called Clink, A Taste of Oregon Wine. Has anyone in the audience seen the exhibit yet? Anyone? Just a few of you. OK, so it's on through September 20th. Um, and just as a reminder, for those of you, even if you're not a member of the Oregon Historical Society, but you do live in Multnomah County, you have free admission to the Oregon Historical Society, to our museum and our research library. And that is in thanks for the good people of Multnomah County who voted four years ago to support us with a property tax levy, which has made a tremendous difference for us. And uh, so our thank you is free admission to the museum and the research library all the time. So don't miss out on that. Um, and that the exhibit really is um, a wonderful overview of some of the fabulous history of the wine industry in Oregon and the people who have made that industry possible, two of whom we're going to hear from tonight. So I wanted to um, offer a little bit of an overview about the history of wine in Oregon uh, and also tell you about the fabulous Oregon Wine History Archive at Linfield College, uh, without which we would not have been able to produce the exhibit that we have on display right now. Um, and unfortunately, well, fortunately for her, but Rachel Woody, who is the archivist at the Wine History Archive, is on vacation right now. So she couldn't be with us tonight, but um, I wanted to make sure to tell you some about this. Um, I wonder if uh, anyone in the audience knows what was the f when the first commercial winery in Oregon uh, first started going. Does anyone have a sense of whose winery that might have been or when that might have happened? No? Okay. What did you say? No, it is Peter Britt. If anyone's been to the Brit Festival down in southwestern Oregon, Peter Britt started Valley View Vineyards in the Rogue Valley. It was 1852. That's the first commercial winery on record in, the, in Oregon. I shouldn't maybe even say in, in what is now the state of Oregon because, of course, Oregon wasn't a state for seven more years after that. Uh, but there were uh, immigrants who came to this place and brought uh, vines with them across the trail. Um, there were more uh, wineries established, but of course, in 1915, uh, Oregon, uh, before the rest of the nation, did what? Prohibition. Nice. Well done. Well done. So we in Oregon, we went dry five years before national prohibition. Uh, and that did not end. I know. I heard somebody booing. I hear you. <laughs> that did not end until 1933 in Oregon. And it was it was really after that time that we started to see more commercial vineyards come back for obvious reasons. And I shouldn't say that no wine was produced in Oregon uh, during that 18 years. And, and I'm not even just talking about illegal wine, but you could legally produce wine for religious purposes in Oregon during Prohibition. So a lot of people were claiming that Catholic heritage uh, during Prohibition. Um, the 1960s is really the beginning of what's now the modern wine era in our state. And it was uh, Richard Summer who planted uh, what we believe were the state's, the first Pinot Noir vines in Oregon. And that's Hillcrest Vineyard. Um, and that was 1961. Um, and he was shortly followed by names many of you are familiar with, Dick Erath, David Lett, Bill Blosser, and Susan Sokol Blosser, and Dick and Nancy Ponzi, who during the 1960s and 1970s began really growing this Pinot Noir wine. And I think Jesus can probably give a lot more information about that than I can. But what I'll say is that I've learned that I found fascinating is that these early wine growers could see the ways that the, the climate and the latitude here in Oregon was similar to the, the Burgundy region in France. And they went, aha, and uh, thought, we ought to give this a shot. And so they did. And now I think, as many people know, uh, Oregon wine is, is valued around the world. Um, and I think if, when you go and look at our exhibit, or um, there, we also published an article in our journal, the Oregon Historical Quarterly, that's available at the Digital Commons through Linfield. And that uh, URL is on this postcard. There are plenty available in the back to pick that up. Um, 
And you'll learn that a lot of the Oregon wine industry, one of the trademarks in this state is a collaborative work of wine, wine growers and winemakers working together to try and foster a statewide brand for Oregon wine. And that, along with a lot of hard work and quality, is one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Um, I've also got that my crib sheet that I'm uh, cheating from back here is a little history of uh, Oregon wine, and there's several of these available in the back, too, if you want to pick them up. So let me tell you a little bit about the Oregon Wine History Archive. Obviously, at the Oregon Historical Society, we uh, believe very much in the value and the importance of documenting and preserving and sharing with the public uh, stories about all things uh, having to do with the history of Oregon. So we are thrilled with the work that Linfield has done to produce this wine archive. And when, uh, when Rachel and her colleagues at Linfield talk about the work that they do at the Oregon Wine History Archive, what they are coming from is the value of work as community-minded archivists. And what that means is that they, they work with community members with the intent to record the community's history and to chronicle its importance as it relates to regional identity. Uh, for many of the people in this field, they create the archive community programs from scratch, out of necessity, uh, because the community's history is so much entwined with the history of everyone else in the region. Uh, so a community archives program is really a proactive project. Um, and they work with content creators, uh, two of whom are here this evening to speak with us, uh, to save, preserve, and share those histories. And they do that, they engage in the uh, platform with the hope, uh, as all of us do, that it will be a sustainable platform with secure funding. So. Here are people working uh, to create the Oregon Wine History Archive. You see there's a, a student here on the left, uh, the owner of Hillcrest, uh, Susan DeMara, a co-owner of Hillcrest, and Rachel Woody, the Oregon Wine History Archive. And you can see they're looking at some of the primary documents that are going into the archive and learning about them and getting those, those notes that are going to go in there. The, the wine industry's relationship with Linfield College began in 1987. Uh, that was the first international Pinot Noir celebration, uh, commonly known as IPNC. And have, has anyone in the audience been to one of those celebrations? You have. Yeah, you guys have. Cool. Well, it sounds amazing. Uh, so they, uh, it was held on the college campus in 1987, and this is what first brought this, uh, these collaborative opportunities between the industry and the college. So they are, here they are picking up collections. When you're a proactive archivist like this, you get to go out into the field and pick up the, the, the content that really is worth saving. So here they are at Amity Vineyards just a few months ago. This archive um, already has an incredible amount of material and they're continuing to build it all the time. This is a little bit of information about the collection donations what to save, what you need to organize first, what types of materials should be in a collection. And they've created this document because they're working with community members who are very busy harvesting grapes, making wine, selling wine, working in this industry. And so to help them make sure we know what needs to be saved and what you have to do with it. And so um, th it, there's co-education happening here. The archivists are, are educating the community members in the industry about what to save. And obviously, members of the industry and the community are educating the archivists quite a bit. I think this is a great caption, digitization in the field, literally. Uh, so here is a, a student uh, out on the Dorner homestead uh, last summer, uh, and she's digitizing photographs and digitizing documents right out there in the field at the vineyard. And so um, it, it's a whole new world, obviously, for researchers and archivists that to have the tangible paper things is still really important because we know how to protect those for hundreds of years at a time, and we haven't had the opportunity to learn how to do that with digital materials yet. Uh, but the digitization of materials and the work they've done at Linfield to put these things online for everyone has really in many ways transformed uh, what researchers and uh, obviously historians are the ones I think about the most uh, are able to access and use. And so it's, it's a fantastic model that they're using. 
Uh, here is Rachel Woody doing uh, the very difficult aspect of her job, uh, speaking with a wine owner and drinking a glass of wine. We feel for her, I know, and that challenge. But one of the things that they're doing at the, at the Oregon Wine History Archive are a lot of oral histories so that you can hear the stories of people who've been involved with this industry, and those are preserved and available for use by documentary filmmakers and historians and um, you know people who write uh, historic novels novels are some of my favorite folks who use archives. And then of course here we have Dick Erath and a student who is set to graduate next year um, working and explaining things to each other and so there's um, the, the curriculum at Linfield uh, are able to work with these um, young scholars and have them in the field working with these industry members right away and uh, for any of you who have had any thought about making wine, the chemistry involved, I understand, is really quite an astounding thing. And so perhaps that looks like maybe a little bit of what they're doing there. So they have the interviews available online. I'm not going to click play right now, but there's the website also for the digital commons. So you can go and listen to these interviews and look at the material. And here's just a little bit of information about resources for the Wine History Archive. So come to the exhibit, check out the things from the archive that we've got, go check it out online. And if you have material that you think belongs in that archive, contact Rachel Christine Woody and tell her about it. Okay, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, we're gonna begin with Jesus Guayan, uh, who followed his father from Mexico to the Oregon Vineyards in 2002. And uh, as he'll tell us, uh, he really fell in love with the state when he got here. He began as a vineyard worker and was doing some education after his education in Mexico to learn English and study winemaking. And he worked his way up and in 2008 became head winemaker of White Rose Estate, a position he continues to hold today. And so then our second speaker will be Leda Garside, who uh, had worked in community health uh, for many years when she joined Tuality Healthcare in 1992. And she began to focus more of her work on migrant health care, and at the same time, leaders in the wine industry were working to, for better ways to serve the health care needs of vineyard workers. Uh, they hired Leda at that time to run the fledgling Salud program in 1997, and she continues in that role today, providing health care to thousands of workers and families that make the award-winning wines of Oregon possible. And so she's brought some copies of her presentation and some information about Salud that's available on the back table as well. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> so I brought a presentation, but it's very, it's very simple, you know. But uh, this is just my my story. Um, after 12 years in in Oregon, I st I'm still learning English, so please bear with me. Um, so uh, my story basically uh, starts, you know, when my dad came to the United States back in the year 2000. Um, a friend of his uh, invited him to come to the U.S. and work in vineyards. Um, his friend works for Temperance Hill, which is a vineyard in, in Salem, Oregon. And uh, my dad worked uh, there for a little bit and then got a job at uh, Tory Moore as a tractor guy. Oops. <laughs> so um, Tory Moore was farming a lot of different vineyards in the area. One of them was uh, White Rose Vineyard. Um, when the current owner of White Rose purchased the property um, in late 2000, uh, his name is, Gre is Greg Sanders, he's a guy from California, so he bought the vineyard and, and uh, my dad was working in the field, so they kind of arranged to work together. Um, as for myself, I, I graduated as a computer systems engineer in Mexico uh, in December of 2001. and. Um, my dad invited me to actually come here because he was saying just wonderful things about Oregon and I had to see it myself. So um, I came, my first, uh, when I first came to Oregon was December 11th of uh, 2001. 
um, and it was night, so I couldn't really see a lot of uh, about Oregon. Um, and um, but I still got a very cool uh, first impression. Um, the the first thing that I did was to take a shower. You know, back in Chihuahua, where I'm from, actually, if you uh, see the map, you know, I tell a lot of people where I'm from, they don't really know. So uh, this is the, the Mexico, and uh, the highlighted part is uh, the state of Chihuahua. So I'm from the south part, which is called Jimenez, which is maybe like uh, 350, 360 miles from the, from the border. So that's where I'm from. Um, and I came to, to Oregon. The first thing I did was to take a shower. You know, in Chihuahua, it's very hot. Most days are over 110 degrees. Um, there is no water. It's very brown. Um, so it's very extremely different from here. So um, that night, um, I took a shower. And over there in Chihuahua, basically, you're looking for the for the little drip of water, you know, to wash your head. Um, and here, I opened the shower, and it was like extremely powerful. You know, a lot of water. I'm like, oh, that's, that's wonderful, you know? <laughs> um, my head hurt, actually, after I took the shower. <laughs> it was really cool. And then the next day, you know, I got to see, actually, this, this is the picture I took from where, from where I was standing in the morning, kind of uh, mid-morning. Um, the rolling hills of vineyards and with manhood in the back. I mean, it was, it was just a standing. Um, I fell in love with Oregon the first time I, I came here. So it was it was wonderful. Um, so um, after I stayed here for like uh, three weeks on a vacation, I went back to Mexico and and for my graduation party. Um, but I had this idea of coming back to Oregon, you know, with my dad and and stay here for like three to six months and learn a little bit of English and then return to Mexico. So I came in March of 2002, um, along with my mom, my sister, and my brother. And uh, I enrolled in at Chemeketa Community College in, in English classes. Um, and um, while I was doing that, I was, was working for White Rose Vineyard. So um, I was able to help him a little bit, you know, some hours in, in the week, um, um, one or two days a week or something like that, and, and studying, you know, uh, English like uh, two nights um, out, of, out of the week, like uh, three, three or four hours. Um, and I got to travel kind of around uh, Oregon, you know, visiting vineyards and everything. So I got very interested in, in, in that portion of it. I got to taste a lot of wine and uh, started to develop the palate for it. Um, so I really, really loved it. And um, when my first term, after kind of almost three months, uh, it was almost my birthday, uh, I was still deciding if staying here or returning to Mexico. Um, because you know I had my career over there, so for me it was a very difficult decision. So I, I, I went, I went actually driving around and uh, made a tasting trip out of it, and I actually found the. Um, I keep journals, you know, and uh, this was the the same day that I uh, that I went on this tasting trip, and. Um, as you see, I was 21, 22 years old, uh, June 10, 2002. And um, I, um, I went to four different wineries, which one of them was Soco Blosser, another one Pantage Creek, which is very close to the area there in the Dundee Hills. Um, and their wines were really good, but didn't really connect to me emotionally. Um, then I went to Archery Summit, and um, there was one wine there that really impressed me a lot. And that wine was the Arcos Estate 1999. Um, that was a beautiful wine. And uh, I bought six bottles of it. Um, <laughs> then after that, you know, I went to Alzheim. And uh, the wine that impressed me there was the Elizabeth's Reserve 1999. So I also bought six bottles of that wine. Um, so driving back to home, you know, from Alzheim, um, I I kind of uh, thought about it and uh, made my mind to, to stay here and pursue a, a winemaking career. Um, as you can see, actually, in the kind of in the uh, surrounded kind of writing portion of it, in the Spanish, there is my goal there um, that says, uh, be a winemaker by the year 2012. Um, 
and make wines comparable to the two wines I tasted on that day, which were the Arcos Estate and the Alzheimer's uh, Elizabeth Reserve. Um, so those are the two wines that made me stay in Oregon. And from them, I, I got the bug to really pursue the kind of, um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, the kind of quality that I was uh, looking for and aiming for. And Oregon was able to achieve uh, that quality. Um, so after I decided that, you know, I, I decided to take action to achieve my goal, you know, becoming a winemaker. So um, I developed different um, schedules. You know, one of these the schedules actually, you know, uh, studying winemaking and English every day. So that was, this was from back in 2003, actually. Um, and uh, my, f my first intent was to enter into the wine industry in whichever work I could find. Uh, my brother was working for Patricia Green Cellars. So I went there with my brother and asked for work. And this gave me work in, in the vineyard, you know, as a vineyard worker. So here I am. So I just started to work for Patricia Green in, in the June 2002 and worked uh, in the vineyard through October 2002. And um, back then, I was actually just earning the minimum. It was, it was like 6.50 an hour. And I was working like 10 hours per day. I mean, 10, 12 hours per day. Um, so there, there were very warm days and everything. So it was, it was cool to, to learn everything, but it's also very tough. Um, so in October 2002, the owner of White Rose, which is Greg Sanders, um, offered me to help him, you know, make the wine in 2002. And he was kind of his own winemaker. He was making the wine himself. Um, so I helped him um, and learned quite a bit, you know, firsthand from him. Um, and I got to work in the vineyard with my dad as well, learn a lot of things about the spray programs, about the uh, all the trellising techniques that we use, uh, a lot of vineyards actually use as well. So a lot of techniques in the vineyard. Uh, I got to see it firsthand, first hand, kind of worked firsthand towards that. And um, the owner is from California, so he got to travel back and forth. And in the year 2004 is when he built the winery. So he needed a guy to kind of oversee the wines there. And uh, he saw my interest in wine and everything. So he uh, offered me the position of seller master. So um, I went for seller master in 2004. Um, working directly with him, you know, he was a winemaker, but he had a consultant, um, which uh, is Mark Vlasek from Saint Innocent. He's the winemaker for um, Saint Innocent in, in Salem, um, and I got access to to his knowledge, you know, working working directly how to make wine. And I basically, I had a lot of questions, so I was very eager to learn. And, you know, my goal was to become a winemaker, which back then was an impossible goal. You know, it was because I, I didn't know any English or didn't know any winemaking at all. Um, but as I was working towards my goal, I, I was actually able to learn a lot. And um, I basically squeezed this guy's brain um, and learned how to make wine. <laughs> so... Um, it's cool that when you have a goal in mind, a, a kind of like a goal in mind, you don't know how to get there, you know, but uh, along the way, you start to notice the things that will help you achieve those kind of goals. So um, when I became seller master and kind of working directly with wine, my goal was to make wine in my own as well, a little bit of wine in my own, because I was always told what to do, you know, to, to make the wine. So uh, in the year 2006, which was a warm vintage, we were working with fruit from Vista Hills Vineyard, which is a neighboring vineyard from, from White Rose over there in the Dandy Hills. Um, and voles, like little little mice-like things, were uh, looking for water, were very desperate for water. So we're biting all the, uh, all the trunks of the vines and kind of ripping, trying to look for water inside the vine. And they killed, uh, it was like a five acre block, so they killed like one acre. Of, of vines. Um, so this is my, my first wine. Um, so uh, the owner of White Rose and myself went before harvest, you know, of 2006, went and saw the vines, tasted the fruit, and the owner said that it was basically garbage, you know, that we should just dump the fruit 
and um, he, he suggested that we just pull out the vines and plant new ones um, and I'm like okay uh, what about the fruit he's like it's just garbage burn it throw it away and I'm like I, I like to make wine from it <laughs> uh, so my my mom my wife um, brother sister and my dad actually went there and harvested the fruit from those vines which was like a 1.2 tons so it was quite a bit of fruit um, and made white wine from it he made actually three three barrels of it um, so months later you know the owner came from California and tasted the wine and he was like wow <laughs> that's really good um, so he called um, the owner of Vista Hills and the owner of Vista Hills came and tasted the wine as well and he really loved it as well they were really impressed um, so I sold two barrels to the owner of Vista Hills so um, I called the wine survivor because you know it was the last thing that survived from those vines so um, the label that you see on the left um, that's the Vista Hills wine and uh, the wine here that is black that it call, is called Lauren you know it was the label that uh, the owner of White Rose selected for that, for that wine um, from that um, the owner of Vista Hills wanted me to actually make wine as well for him so he offered me a partnership you know with a little bit of fruit um, he will give me the fruit I will make the wine bottle it and we'll split the wine at the end 50-50 so no money up front for me which was good because I didn't have any um, so um, from from in the 07 vintage is that's the way I made my wine um, which is the one in the middle is called, it's called uh, dream catcher I wasn't gonna call the wine catcher of a dream but I saw you know this little thing in the dictionary in dream catcher I'm like okay that's dream catcher that's cool um, a lot of people ask me if I am Native American I'm, I'm not it's just a uh, you know, it's just a symbol that symbolizes catching my dream, basically. Um, so after some years passed, you know, the I got more experience in in, in winemaking. Um, so the owner actually, in the year 2008, uh, it was October 1st, 2008, it's when he told me that I could be the winemaker for White Rose, that if I wanted that opportunity, I'm like, absolutely, yes. That, that's my goal, you know, that's, that was my whole goal. Um, so I became winemaker of White Rose in, in 2008. Um, and he also told me, um, you know, we've been making wine for some time now, and, and uh, we make very good wines, but, you know, the, the critics are not really that fond of us. Um, I think the highest score that we got from, from those wines was like 90, 91 points, you know, from, from them. Um, and he told me, if you ever get, you know, as a kind of uh, as like a 94, 94 point uh, score from those critics, I will actually pay you, you know, like a trip to Hawaii for a week, all paid with for you, your wife. And, and I'm like, cool. Well, uh, you know, uh, this year, it's really good. It was 2008. I mean, it was one of the greatest years Oregon has ever seen. And... Um, I told him, you know, this could be the year. It's like, no, just, you know, settle down in your job. Uh, just uh, work well. You know, eventually you'll you'll be there in like 10, 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I became winemaker. Um, and then in, well, we made the wine in 08. Then we made the wine in 09. And uh, in 2010, when we were about to release the 08, 2008 vintage, um, the critic for the wine advocate actually called the winery and said that he wanted to taste our wines and we're like okay well he came and uh, he tasted the wines and um, we couldn't really read them you know because they just taste take notes and leave um, so we couldn't tell if he likes the wines or he didn't like the wines he didn't make any facial expressions or anything like that we're like okay cool <laughs> <laughs> so uh, two months after um, 
for my first vintage, the 2008 vintage, um, the uh, scores, the the scores for from the Wine Advocate were released uh, or published in the little publication that they have, and these were the scores. So, two of my wines got uh, two ninety-four plus wine <laughs> plus. <laughs> So this actually made me uh, go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, for the second vintage, um, for my second vintage, um, when I returned actually from Hawaii, uh, the owner told me, you know, if you ever actually make uh, a wine that is 96 or over, <laughs> you could go to Hawaii again. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's cool. And he's like, well, you know, 10 years on the road, that's, that's good. I mean, we got very good press now, that's really cool. So in my second year, I got a 96 point wine. <laughs> <laughs> Only about three winemakers in, in Oregon can say that they got a 96 point from a magazine, you know. Um, this doesn't really mean a lot, you know, it means that just basically the, the, the guy liked the wine quite a bit because in Oregon we've been making wine, good wine for a long time and they don't really want to recognize it. But this is a good sign that they are willing to recognize now uh, because they are just afraid to give big scores to, to Oregon wines uh, because of Burgundy. So will this be kind of second to Burgundy is what they maybe say, but uh, I think uh, a lot of our wines are comparable in quality and uh, our prices are way better. <laughs> um, so my, my third vintage, you know, um, the white advocate actually changed critics, so um, the new critic wasn't really a fan of us, so he didn't like uh, our style quite a bit. We got very strong scores from him from 90 to 92, but uh, not really something that was like a 94 or 96, something like that. Um, but something really cool happened uh, with the local media. Um, Portland Monthly actually organizes um, like a tasting. Uh, they accept some submissions, you know, from different uh, from different wineries. All the wineries in in Oregon, well, whoever wants to submit wines. Um, and uh, in 2012, we submitted uh, two wines. Uh, it was the first time that we submit wines for them. And they've been making this kind of uh, competition for a while. Um, so in that year, uh, they selected four sommeliers in in the Portland area, wine connoisseurs um, with a lot of experience. And um, over a period of two weeks, they tasted the all the wines, which were over a over 500 wines, and all of them were tasted blind, so they couldn't tell what they were tasting. So it was impressive for me to see this um, because for my third vintage, um, the two wines that we selected were number one and number two. <laughs> it was really impressive. <laughs> so that's, that's good. <laughs> And uh, well, last year, you know, one of my dreams, uh, when I became a winemaker, actually, my dream is to have my own, um, my own winery. And last year, I actually did a little bit of, kind of like a small step towards that. So I finally got um, licensing um, for making my own wine. And this is what my future holds. Um, so my little label is like 80 cases and uh, I'm expecting to increase that to 250 cases this year. Um, and it's called Guillem Family. So hopefully uh, um, I'm thinking this to leave that to, to my son in the future um, and follow kind of our, our dreams. Um, this is just um, my story in Oregon, all the opportunities that I, that I got, you know, um, I, I grabbed them and uh, because I really wanted something and uh, I worked really hard to realize it. Um, but we have to realize that we're in Oregon, which is one of the most beautiful places in, on earth. 
uh, and when making wine here or Pinot Noir wine here that um, is some of the best in the world um, the wine spectator actually just named the the wine region here uh, just second to Burgundy um, which you know I've tasted a little Burgundy and I don't think that's entirely true um, there are maybe like four or five vineyards in Burgundy that are way high that we can't possibly uh, get just because they have vineyards that are hundreds hundreds of years old and um, they've been through a lot of generations you know so they have everything really well dialed in but I would say that a lot of our wines is it's comparable to a lot of the Burgundy wine so we're fortunate to be here I'm very fortunate to be here and uh, well, thank you very much <laughs> Amazing story. Seriously, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, buenas noches. Um, my name is Leda Garside. I'm a registered nurse. I work at Duality Healthcare in Hillsboro. It is a, a great pleasure to be here uh, to talk to you about the other piece of the presentation. And what I'm going to be talking is about the outreach program that we do directly to into the vineyards to uh, benefit of the uh, vineyard workers and their families. Again, it's, uh, it's great to be, to be here and, and tell you uh, about this program called Salud. I've known the Guillen family for, for a long time and, uh, and stories like what Jesus and what he has accomplished is what make it all worthwhile and makes it really uh, priceless um, and it's, it's just it's just great uh, for the salute program is uh, our mission is is very simple um, we are here to provide health care services to the vineyard workers and their families we go directly where they work where they live where they play and where they pray as a friend of mine say is uh, a program very unique uh, in the nation. We are probably the only one in the United States that provide healthcare services in the way that we do. For me as a clinician, it's, uh, it's a great honor to provide uh, direct healthcare services in the way that we do, uh, promoting a lot of education, um, lots of uh, prevention, um, lots of uh, uh, showing people where to go for health care if they need it and just to know the people I think that's what is so uh, been so rewarding I was born and raised in Costa Rica I came to the United States as a young bride I have some family members here that know my whole life story um, and nursing has been an amazing career it has given me the opportunity to travel to many places to do direct patient care um, in open heart uh, surgery and direct uh, uh, neurosurgery um, and uh, occupational health and now community health. And this is what I thrive, this is what I like and, and this is what I, what I uh, value of my nursing career that has really uh, show me a different way to, to bring these services directly to the people. And two, um, the other thing too is with the vineyard workers is that we're dealing with a community that works so hard to bring an amazing product for us to enjoy. Uh, the Salud program uh, was born out of the Tuality Healthcare in Hillsboro, home base is Hillsboro. And it was uh, an idea that, that came from a group of physicians, um, hospital personnel, wine uh, and vineyard owners that wanted to do something for the workforce, um, wanted to do something different to address the healthcare needs of, of, the, uh, of the vineyard workers. So again, home care, I mean, home, uh, home base is Hillsboro. 
but we cover eight counties throughout the North uh, Willamette Valley. As we can go as far south as uh, Eugene, uh, Southwest Eugene. Uh, we have mapped the whole uh, state for all the different uh, wine regions, and the dream is someday to be able to provide these services throughout the state. Again, the, the program uh, was born in 1991 and is continued to be very strong today. Uh, we had the, the way that this has been done is uh, do a wine auction uh, every November. It, we, the, the wineries select the very best of their reserves and uh, we do a very uh, uh, a wine auction where cases of wine are sold and that's where our the proceeds for our program come. Uh -huh. You know, everything that is raised in there comes to support what we do. We don't get any federal or state funds. It's all privately raised through this wine auction and many other events that we do throughout the year. And this is an example of, uh, of, of the idea also was born from a, from a program that exists in France. It's, it's a, a group of nuns that have a hospital and they're being uh, doing this type of service, providing uh, direct service to the to the vineyard wor workers in their area, and they do a festival after harvest, and so that's how the idea was born. So, what are the qualifications for our program? It's very simple. We just go into the vineyards, we identify who is there, who the workers are, who their family members are. Um, it's totally voluntary. Uh, we go um, in an annual basis, we have to register, so we keep very uh, close records of who the population is. Um, we also know where, what area of, uh, of Mexico, most of them are um, uh, Mexican nationals, where they come from. And, um, and the registration is, again, is access to the healthcare services. There is no fee attached to this program, which is very important. Um, we also make sure that the that we uh, build really strong relationship with the workers. As a Latina myself, um, we value trust. We really want to trust the people that are with us. Um, a lot of these workers, again, are seasonal uh, migrant workers, so we have to really work in gaining that trust. And that is something that that I could say that we've done really strong in the last uh, 17 years that I've been involved with this program. So one of the things that, uh, that I would like to talk for because it's important is to know what is, what is, a, what is a migrant worker? What is a, a seasonal uh, farm worker? And this is the definition that we see a lot in the books and I just bring that because it's good to understand uh, what these individuals come from, what's their uh, trajectory to arrive uh, here. You already learned from, from Jesus where he come from, his family comes from. Um, I have a map of Mexico in my office and we pinned every little area where the people come from. Every time somebody comes to the office, we give them a little pin and say, where are you from? Tell me which little town in Mexico you're from. So we're able to, to see that because that's very important. For me, as a clinician, I had, and I'm a Latina, Spanish is my first language. Um, however, I had to learn a lot about the Mexican culture. I had to learn a lot about where my clients come from, what are their cultures, what are their uh, cultural beliefs, how they take care of their health, um, what work for them, what doesn't work for them. Um, Again, those little nuisances that is so important to know, um, you know, just, just to build that relationship that so that we know that that individual will have full trust to come and tell us the things that they need to tell us. Because, you know, migrant, migrant and seasonal farm uh, work is not easy. It's very intense, it's labor intense, it's, um, and, it's, and it's really, f I mean, physically, it is, it is hard. And so we track, again, these are the migration uh, tracks that we know in the US. People come from Mexico to different streams. Uh, we also have a lot of people that live in Texas and migrate here to the Pacific Northwest to work. 
Um, and so we track all of those. Then we also have individuals that travel within the state. For example, we have people that may reside in Washington County, but they work in Marion County, and they travel on a daily basis for work. Um, I know workers that are maybe down in King Estate, which is uh, Southwest Eugene, but they live in Woodburn, and so they travel every day to that, to that vineyard to work. Um, the same way, we have people that live in Woodburn, and they come to Hillsboro to work, and vice versa. So we uh, collect all that information and track all that information. So that's how we categorize whether the person is a migrant worker or a seasonal uh, farm worker. The, um, the one thing that, that we have here in Oregon is there is approximately 175,000 migrant workers in, in the state of Oregon. Uh, this is a statistics that has been the same as statistics for the last 12 years, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, again, most of the migrant workers in the state of Oregon come from Mexico even though we've seen a lot of people also from Guatemala. The other thing with, uh, with migrant workers that is uh, uh, important to know is that not everybody speaks Spanish. We also have individuals that come that only speak an indigenous language. And so for us as clinicians, we have to be very aware of that so that when we ask questions, we just don't assume that the person speaks Spanish. And, and, and interesting enough, a lot of the individuals that speak an indigenous language, many of them will speak better English than they speak Spanish, particularly the children. And that is, again, something very interesting to see, to see that the kids pick up the English very fast. The um, Oregon industry is quite new. Um, the modern wine, the, the modern wine uh, industry is, pr is fairly new. It's on, under 50 years old, and um, and and it's very family oriented. And I think that's what has made a big difference in Oregon with these workers and this particular program. A lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, owners work alone with with the farm workers. They planted those vines themselves. And so we see a lot of families that have worked with, with some of the vineyard owners for many, many years. And, um, and, it's, um, and that's what makes it so special. And I think that's why we have such a huge commitment from the wine industry to this program. Because again, we just deliver the services. We collaborate at a, as a hospital with, with the industry to deliver these services. So the other thing that is good to understand is about the barriers um, and healthcare utilization of migrant workers. They face many barriers on a daily basis. Um, our main job is to make sure that the workers and their family members know where to go if they have an illness, that they know that there is a clinic, a community health center nearby where they can go seek that care that we educate them on how um, to access the services of primary care and avoid going to uh, an emergency room. And that's been a big, a big labor of ours is to, is to really um, educate and, and to show where they can go for services. With uh, migrant um, workers, um, you know, we have the barriers of language barriers, uh, living conditions. I'm, I'm very pleased that at least for the, with the vineyard workers, um, most of them live in, in the areas where they live, in the towns, they rent homes, they rent apartments, uh, they live in different uh, housings that are specifically made for farm workers. But we have also seen some very um, horrible living conditions for agricultural workers. Um, we have many camps in the area around here, not too far from here, within an hour and a half from where we're sitting right now. And there is camps that there's just, you just don't understand how these exist in, in here in Oregon, but they do exist. Um, the lifestyle of migration can be very hard. Um, and of course, the documentation status and the lack of ethnicity and cultural competence program, uh, particularly in healthcare. And that's something that we're working really hard in fixing. And, and the same thing with the, with the health um, 
you know, with the, with the health insurance, at least for some of the children um, that are now covered, but the parents are not. So what is the, um, the contribution of the migrant workers to our economy? Um, this is what is, uh, you know, nationwide. It's, uh, it's quite a large amount of money that migrant workers are, are contributing to our, in to our economy. And, uh, and also they're uh, a big part of our workforce in agriculture. Oregon, as we know, is a very uh, high agricultural uh, state. And we have you know, large nurseries and, 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 and other industry, but again, with the, with and the wine industry that is just growing leaps and bounds. So health issues, and those are the things that we concentrate, is to make sure that uh, to learn more about their occupational hazards, um, social mental health problems. And this is with the social mental health problems. That's one of the things that I, in one of my trips that I took to Mexico, that is uh, something that I learned a lot was about, you know, just the, the mental anguish or the mental stress that it caused when you migrate particularly if you're migrating in the way that a lot of workers migrate to, agricultural workers migrate here, or seasonal agricultural workers migrate to the U.S. Um, so it's leaving a lot of families behind. Um, so, you know, lots of them are male for the most part, uh, even though now they're becoming uh, more a part of our, of our um, society and our neighborhoods and, and all of that. So prenatal care and child health, um, for the most part, the prenatal care for a new agricultural, a new seasonal um, worker, they have very healthy pregnancies, which is, which is a blessing. Um, and, uh, but, also we, but we also see uh, now beginning to see some more issues on that, but we tried really hard on, on, on providing the, the care and where to go for that. Asthma and respiratory illness is very common for other industry, not so much for the, for the uh, wine industry, but that is an issue that happened in agriculture. Oral health is an issue that is, is really rampant and, 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 is, and is expensive. Um, the diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, that is something that we deal on a daily basis. So for Salud, what do we do? We just promoting the wellness and prevention um, what we are doing is just going into the vineyards, identifying the, the individual, uh, providing them with, with uh, information of the clinics. Uh, we do provide some direct patient care um, and just um, uh, provide them with, uh, with the names, again, of, of the clinics. Uh, we also have a mobile unit uh, where we bring and do exams on, on the field. Um, we also collaborate with other um, agencies in the area, for example, Medical Teams International. They have a, a dental, dental mobile unit, and we provide those services. We work with Pacific University as well. They have a dental, dental program, and many of the community health centers as well, and, uh, and many universities where they bring their students uh, alone, and, and we just provide those uh, direct patient care. So the aim of the program for me as a clinician has always been to be a holistic approach. We just treat the whole body. We just don't separate the, the body head from the rest. Um, so it's just something that is, is um, making sure that the, that the person know where to go for, for dental if they need it, if they're pregnant, where to go for pregnancy. If somebody has a earache, where to go for that. Um, the, uh, the, the program has registered uh, over 12,000 people since uh, we started in 1998, at least in, in the role that I play. And the big thing is the investment that we have made into the healthcare services. And the other thing is the ripple effect that this program has, because it's not just providing the services to the worker, to the workers and their families, but it's also what it's doing to the rest of the community health centers. And, and to doctors and to, and to hospitals in the area. Um, because we can capture when a health care is, er, health care issue is, is we can capture early enough 
Uh, for example, if we go into a vineyard and we do a diabetes test for somebody and their blood sugar is really high, then we're able to say, okay, we need to refer you to primary care. Here's where you need to go. And so we make that intervention. If we discover that somebody has high blood pressure, the same thing. We can act early on so that we can prevent that emergency room visit from happening. And so it's always that prevention, education, prevention, education. Constantly, 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 constantly. As a result, um, again, we're able to save a lot of funds and we're able to, to make it um, uh, or the intervention early on. This is the uh, expense of our program uh, on, on last year, and, and this is what it costs, $152. That's how we, what we spend per person on an annual basis. And what it says, the, the cost for the encounter, that is when somebody goes into a clinic. And as I say, it's comprehensive. We uh, make sure that the person has access to, to dental care, uh, to primary care, and to vision as well. So how we stretch that dollar is what it's all about. Um, we are able to, to stretch, stretch, stretch <laughs> as much as we can. Um, when someone's talk about healthcare reform, that is something that we've been doing in this program for many, many years, is again, is doing that, that, that early intervention um, making sure that we have the collaborative um, uh, relationships with, with many other people in the community to be able to negotiate because that's something that we do a lot is to negotiate with, with the doctors, uh, with, uh, with hospitals, with uh, other uh, healthcare providers for the care of these individuals. And two is that it's not, this is not free care, which is, uh, I get that question a lot, is this free care? And I say, no, it's not. Because the workers are really also contributing a great deal to their own care. Uh, we assess some and they also pay some. So, and, and that's why we're able to deliver the care that we deliver with the amount of money that we have. So this is what Salud is all about, is making a difference, it's a commitment from the part of the industry. Again, this is, is a, an idea that was born by the industry, um, something that they knew that was very important to take care of the, of the field workers and their families, is to go where they live, to show them where those uh, healthcare services are, uh, to do that health promotion, that education, and just to improving, you know, the, the healthcare outcomes. Um, is anyone here in public health? No? You? Okay. Um, so in public health, and I'm going to use a very technical term, we use a term that's called upstream, uh, upstream approach, and that is that you start treating the illness way ahead of time way up high, way up the river, before it becomes critical, acute. And so that's what this, this program has, has been doing for the last 17 years, is to make sure that we can seek those services, that we can identify the health issue way early. And it's a multidisciplinary um, approach. One of the things that, that we enjoy tremendously in our program is that it's a clinical site for many um, healthcare uh, students. All fields, from optometry to nursing, physicians, physical therapy, occupational therapy, dental. So it's a very good opportunity for, for those students to come and learn about community health, to learn about um, uh, public health, and, uh, and to learn about culture, and to learn about you know, how to take care of, uh, of, of migrant health. You know, migrant health is not easy. That's one of the things when I started this program, uh, I thought I knew about migrant health, and to my surprise, I really didn't know much about migrant health. 
um, is just a challenge. Is a lot of the workers move a lot, uh, but we also have a core group of individuals that we follow through. But we see um, a lot of new faces on, on an annual basis. And so our job is to identify them, again, to, s to know who they are and, uh, and what services we, we can provide while they're here working in our, in our fields and in our agricultural industry. To get more information about our program, this is our web, uh, web page. And also, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Gracias. that your map just took you in Mexico. Do you also cover other <coughs> Latin American countries? Uh, for the people that we, we uh, identify, most of the workers come from Mexico and Guatemala. Those are the two main sources of uh, agriculture workers in our country. Uh, at least or in Oregon. Those are the, the main two countries. I have a question about uh, learning about winemaking, talking with other people. In, I don't know if you have uh, a lot of contact with other agricultural industries, but is that a common theme? Like if somebody was interested in growing apples, they wanted to be an orchardist. I mean, is there the same kind of collaboration? You have all these mentors. That's pretty amazing. I wonder if that's unusual or a common experience. Did you hear the question? <laughs> <laughs> In Oregon, it is. It is uh, very easy to find mentors here because people here are willing to share what they have learned over the years. And if, if you're in the industry and you go to ask questions to everybody, everybody will tell you what they do. It's the wonderful thing about Oregon is to er everything is every everybody is just willing to share their their knowledge, and I was able able to learn a lot just by going to wineries tasting, and um, you know I was kind of tasting in the tasting room, and uh, I'm like you know I, I'm a vineyard worker for Patricia Green, and they're like oh uh, they took me to the cellar you know give me the tour and everything the winemaker was there I was able to talk to the winemaker I mean just uh, it's just amazing the access to the people or the information of what they're doing. So I think um, even if you don't find mentors, you, you'll find a way to, to learn here. It's just amazing. I, I would like to follow up on that because that is, that is very true and, and that what really speaks volumes for this program. It's, it's, the, it's the industry is really close and they have come together just as they share their notes about the winemaking they let us have full access of their workers during business hours. And they really care. If somebody, if something is happening with one of the workers, I get to know about that the next day, immediately. So they really, there's, there's great communication and they really help each other tremendously. You know, um, sorry. Uh, we, we know we're, we're competition, you know, because we're competing actually to sell our wine, but uh, at the end we know that we're, we're working together for one brand, and that's basically Oregon wine, and that's why everybody is willing to share everything, because we're going to place Oregon wine way up here in the world. Thank you. Thank you for asking for, for that question because one of the things that I have learned throughout the years is, and, and Jesus can answer that question better than I can, but from someone who comes from occupational health background, just to take a look at the tasks that they do, there's always something going on in the vineyard. 
and um, there is um, there is like you start with the pruning in early early January. And one thing I forgot I, I did not mention is that Oregon wine is all is all hand all the vineyards in Oregon are hand touch everything. There's no very now you're beginning to see some mechanization, but that's not the routine in Oregon. It's all labor, hand labor. Every every little piece of, of that vine is touched by somebody's hands. And it is a skill. And that's some one that's one of the things that I say is a skill. Because you need to know when a vine is growing, and again Jesus can explain that, but this is just from my observation, is the skill is when the vine starts when after you prune, you need to know which ones, which canes you're going to cut. Because if you cut the wrong cane, sorry, next year is not going to be good. When it starts growing, you gotta go and I you gotta go and debut what it called, taking the buds out and just leaving the ones that you need. Then as the vines start growing, you gotta go tight. So you have a lot of repetition, hands, finger, repetition. Okay? Then you have to lift the wire. And then you gotta tie. Then you gotta prune. Then too many leaves. Then you gotta the leaf. Take leaves, there's a lot of hand, you know. Then it comes to, um, what else? Leafing, pruning, the, the clo oh, yes, cluster thinning. A lot of, when you have a lot of clusters and if too many, then they start taking, you know, taking some off. Then if there's too much fruit in the vine, they go and drop fruit. And then there is harvest time. And each bucket, because I've measured those, because we have studied that because of our ergonomics, back injuries, shoulders, hands, is the, uh, each bucket, when you car come harvest, is you run, and you are, because you're getting, that's when you're making a lot of your money, because you get, you get paid by the piece and by the bucket. So the faster you are, and I've seen women, how many, how many, how, oh, <laughs> I mean, uh, we know one lady that can, you know, I mean, it's, and it's 25 pounds each bucket. So you're carrying, you're running with 50 pounds up and down, up and down all day long. And you can get up to, you know, how many, 500 pounds? Yeah, and mostly in the, in the muddy, you know, in the mud. <laughs> so we do a lot of the occupational health training as well about, uh, you know, ergonomics, uh, stretching, exercises for your arms, for your hands. Um, back safety, um, making sure that people have the right shoes. I've been in, I've been in sometimes in harvest, and I see somebody with street shoes. It's like, ew, you know, let's just uh, do something about that. Um, so it's there is most most of the injuries I will say probably is low back and sometimes in the shoulder when you're lifting the wires because that's a lot of work, a lot of work. Just one more thing. Actually, it's very cool that Oregon is very environmentally friendly. So uh, we spray chemicals that are very cool, you know. <laughs> no, they're not very offensive, which is good. But other places, you know, they, they spray a lot of chemicals in the vineyards, and uh, it really hurts the, the people's um, respiratory systems. Yeah. How do the workers find the vineyards? Work in? Is there some organization coordinating that? Or? Um, you know, a lot of the uh, the vineyards is a lot of word mouth, and also uh, there is a lot of families that that work in the vineyards. So, for example, you can go to Vineyard X, and you will find someone that comes from a specific area of Mexico, and they know, you know, their cousins or their friends or family friends, and. And so you see a lot of a lot of that, but but you see it's a lot of who knows who and 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 they need. And that's the one thing that is happening now in Oregon is that there's not enough agricultural workers. Um, period. In general, there is almost a t uh, 15 to last I hear between 15 and 20 percent decrease in in seasonal and uh, migrant agricultural workers. So harvest is going to be quite interesting this year. They get paid uh, minimum wage. Yeah, which is nine something. <laughs> uh, 
and some uh, and also depends on the tasks that you do in the vineyard uh, for example a tractor driver will make more than a field worker and and so on and so forth um, as I said with vineyard workers most of them uh, they either rent an apartment together or or rent a home or many of them um, access what, what we call what, what is called agricultural housing that is such the, we have there's several organizations throughout in all the counties that provide that type of housing and and they're really um, it's a is a godsend because it's a they're very nice apartments and 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 there's uh, a lot of rules in those apartments, but it's, but it's good and they offer a lot of services. Where can I get your wine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> White Rose Wines or my wine? <laughs> um, my wine actually, um, it's sold through a list. Um, I sell out every 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 year just because I make 80 cases only so there is like 150 people on that list um, and it's on my website uh, guillenfamily.com you can actually sign up in the email and I send out emails you know like maybe once a month and I have like tastings of my wine I, I would say like twice or three times a year and uh, you get a chance to taste it and if you like it you can buy it where is your wine in location? Um, the winery I work for is located in the Dundee Hills. Um, so it's the Dundee Hills area. Uh, it's between Dundee and McMinnville. So um, it's very close to the most uh, reputable wineries in the area. Archery Summit, Domain Druin, Domain Serene. They're, they're all our, our neighbors there. Um, I don't have a winery yet, but I'll have it later. <laughs> from Gary Andrews which was actually the founder for Archery Summit um, he was using a lot of whole cluster fermentation so when I was talking to him about that he um, kind of you know gave me a lot of ideas on how to make the wine that way um, I didn't like a lot of things that he was doing so I, I tweaked a lot of things um, so I use whole cluster meaning that I use the stem and everything the standard way to make wine here is um, basically only using the berry so they destem uh, the cluster so, so remove the stem and just ferment the the berries which is the skin with the pulp and and, and the seed um, as for myself you know i find that if the, the stem is mature or, or lignified which is kind of like a brownish when it starts to die on the vine uh, tastes very spicy you put it in your mouth it's very spicy and you know beautiful tasting so um that's why I, I add uh, stems. And um, over the years, I tasted a, a lot of Burgundies, which I consider the top five vineyards in the world. Uh, about three of them use 100% whole cluster fermentation. So that's when uh, I really um, got into the idea of adding stems to, to the wines. Um, so that's basically what I, what I do uh, for um, for cap management, which is basically when you have the tank, you know, filled with with the um, the grapes, um, when the fermentation starts, uh, the yeast start it starts to eat the sh the sugar and poops out basically uh, alcohol and CO2 and some heat, and uh, as the CO2, okay, which is a gas, you know, goes out of the solution, uh, all the solids go up, and the juices stay kind of in the bottom. So if you keep it like that, you won't get extraction. So you have to push down the, the, the solids because you get all the color only from the skins. Um, so you have to punch it down, which is kind of the normal practice. As for myself, what I do is I pump the, the juice from the bottom to the top, which is a pump over, is what, it, what it's called. And uh, that's a more gentle way to, to get extraction from the, 
from their skins, but also, also it's very, um, very kind of um, elegant way to, to manage the, the cap and that you get extraction only from the outside of the stem because if you shoe it, you know, if you shoe a stem of the grape, uh, the inside of the stem is very astringent and the outside is barky, kind of woody. Uh, so I like to get extraction from the outside. So it's more about tannin management or kind of uh, flavor management. Um, so it's, that's, that's what I use. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm, I'm from California, and uh, I was used to a, a labor camp in San Joaquin County, um, which uh, was a, uh, also a, a place for, for school children to be reached, um, but it was also a place where health care could be delivered as well. And I was wondering, do you, do you have a similar labor camp situation in, in, this, in the Oregon? Yes, we do. Uh, there are several several camps in, in, in Oregon, and there is a clinic uh, in the area that does uh, provides direct services to, to those camps. And we collaborate also with that, with that particular clinic, and we go with them when they go into the camps. And so we can identify if there's anyone that is uh, working at the vineyards, we can, we can do that and see that. Or we can also do some education for those individuals that are that are there. Um, you know, I mean, Oregon is no is, is is the agriculture here industry is huge. I mean, you got the beautiful berries, every berry that you can think of. You know, you got the bla the the blueberry uh, industry, which is growing tremendously, and it's also all hand labor. I mean, all of that, everything that is produced here in Oregon is all hand labor. Uh, so the demand for for you know agricultural workers is is huge. So, but they, yes, there is there are several camps, and as I said earlier, some are some are very nice, other ones are not so nice. Is there wine produced in Eastern Oregon? Uh, yes, there is a, an area in, in Eastern Oregon for there is the Columbia Gorge, and then there is another one very close to the Idaho border, kind of midway uh, down there. Yeah. Um, at a particular vineyard, is there the amount of labor that's employed, I mean, does it vary a lot, or is there a fairly stable labor force throughout the year? It's, uh, it's very different from e every vineyard requirement because there are a lot of different techniques, um, and a lot of people make wine differently and grow, wine, grow grapes differently. So some vineyards require way more labor than and others, uh, like our vineyard, White Rose Vineyard, you know, has a very high trellising system, which is like maybe like eight or nine feet tall. So the standard is maybe like five or six feet. So you have to train and kind of get in the ladder, you know, and put the clips on top or the wires on top to gra to, to put the, the, the stuff, well, the, the shoots, um, train them really well up there. Um, so normally um, a vineyard, you know, normal vineyard, um, it will be like maybe four to five thousand dollars per acre to take care of it. Ours takes like nine thousand, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it depends on how uh, how they grow the, the vine grapes. So, for example, a vineyard may have may have a core group of workers. Uh, if that will help you answer the question, for example, you can have. A vineyard can have a core group of, uh, you know, anywhere between six to uh, 15 individuals that are there year round. They're doing everything, like after harvest, that's the crew that stays to clean, to, you know, finish the task after harvest. Um, but throughout the year, depend what kind of task they're doing, then that's when they require uh, the labor, because it could be um, I mean, I've been to vineyards where we go on the clinic, and I always ask the vineyard manager, how many people are going to be here today? Because we do vaccinations as well, and we do all these 
health screenings and I need to know numbers. And they say, oh, maybe 30. I say, okay, great. Then I arrive there and, they, and we always bring extra, thank God. And then there's always a contractor. And there's another 30 people. So instead of 30, we end up seeing, you know, 60, sometimes up to 90 people in, in one place. And it depends what task. Like right now, and that's what is so seasonal, for example, right now, the grapes are just turning color. That's all they're doing right now. They just finished dropping, some are still dropping fruit. Um, about two weeks ago, they were de-leafing, taking a lot of leaves out. So that takes, that's really, it's hand is all going there and take or with a, with a special uh, scissors, uh, pruners that they use. So that requires a lot of labor. Um, but right now, like a lot of people are home waiting, waiting for the, for the harvest to come, which is going to come very early this year. It is, it starts normally, um, I would say it's in the valley here, uh, maybe September uh, 20th. Um, like our vineyard, we always harvest it like um, two days or on Halloween, basically, because we're really high in elevation, so our, our vines mature a little later. Um, but this year might be a month early. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's been warm and the vines are just loving it. That they love it. <laughs> Lita, you, uh, your perspective is healthcare delivery, but my heart, as from a historical perspective, started to beat faster when I heard you your documentation of workers and their origins. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, what's the ultimate uh, resting place of those? of that information that you take. I hope you're, it's destined for some historical discussion because, you know, in the future it may be the only documentation that some people have of their yeah. activities and their origins. Yeah, thank, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, uh, our, with, with the work with this project that Linfield College is doing, I think a lot of that information is going to live there. I love research. That's something that I, uh, I do. And so, um, and as a nurse, it's, it's so phenomenal just to be able to do that type of research, population base, and you know, um, and, is, and, and so I'm working with other um, colleagues to, to collect that data. Well, we, we have, our bank of data is incredible. It's, 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 so, it's so good, and many people want it, <laughs> and we're just like, no, it's ours. Um, but because we have collected so much information about where the people come from, um, how long they've been in the U.S., where they come from, uh, where they've been when they arrive in the U.S., where and so it's, it's, it's so much so much information, and not just that, but also their their health data. You know how they've progressed. I mean. Um, I know workers that I that I've known for now 17 years, um, and just to to see that trajectory and 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 it's so that all that information is being uh, safe right now in our own uh, data bank and and you know and it's ready for with that we have published a few a few things and it will and the plan is to continue publishing that data and use it as a as a teaching method because. I did not show you guys, I didn't want to bore you with that particular piece, but I have a, and I'm very proud to say, a, f a really awesome uh, nursing um, diagram that I use as a, the nursing model for, for the outreach that I'm doing, and, and it's quite phenomenal. So um, that is going into the books. We use it for, to teach other nurses that come, particular public health nurses, uh, to, to use that as a guide if that's the way that they want to go into. Can you give an example of, the culture of a cultural difficulty that you might encounter in dealing with that population of indigenous say? Um, well, yeah, language is as big as I say. Some indigenous, some uh, some of the population does not speak Spanish, so um, I have to use uh, some other interpreter to help me to interpret um, um, 
for example, test results. And, and, I, and I give you an example. Just uh, last week, we were at a vineyard. I had a young uh, a woman who had a blood sugar of 350. She did not speak any Spanish, very broken Spanish. So I'm trying to be at her same level, uh, pawn down my Spanish, show her numbers, show her pictures. And, um, and so, and then I hear one of her friends was very bilingual Spanish, indigenous language. So I say, hey, can you? help us here I just want to make sure that she understand the consequences of this and what this number means and that I'm sending her to this clinic so can you make sh can, can we uh, help help me to make sure that that message is, is sent across so that's an example for me as a Latina speaking Spanish the big challenge is when they come into our clinics and our hospitals and somebody doesn't um, offer the language and it's important to when you're working in healthcare that you address those health issues in the language, in the native language, language of that individual because they understand it better. And you get a, you get a better, um, better health outcome when you explain the native language. So that's, I hope that answered your question. We have one question. What kind of, is there any insurance payment that these people can apply for their care? If you send somebody to a clinic, mm -hmm. you're not funding it out of your 600,000 already. We funding uh, we are funding some of that uh, expense. Um, the worker also pay for some of that expense, and then we assist uh, help them through go through the uh, financial assistance process. Um, most of the workers of the seasonal and agricultural or um, migrant workers, because they are uh, undocumented, they cannot access some of none of those uh, healthcare services for insur insurance wise. They do not have access to that because of documentation. Um, so a migrant worker then is here, and you said, I mean, they might be like in the grape industry, um, picking leaves off, and then they have to wait for the harvest and the rest of that. In the meantime, do they work in other agricultural fields then? Do the workers that are here move around within the state to differ whatever happens? Ah, yeah, yes, they do. And that's so that we share a lot of the workers. For example, um, right now there's uh, some blueberries that are being picked right now. So a lot of the workers that are, in, that are not in the field, in the vineyards, there could be in the blueberry. Uh, some go into um, um, uh, like uh, any, any, of the, any of the other orchards, uh, uh, for example, pears or apples, exactly. And then after harvest, when it's done, there's no more work in the vineyards, then a lot of the uh, workers head out to the Christmas trees uh, farms. And, or, and again, Oregon is the number one Christmas tree farm producer in the world. So, and that's talking about intense and dangerous work. That is one. Uh, yes, we, we track that. Uh, Mexico has, there is about, probably about 24, I, I want, let me say 25 indigenous languages in Mexico. So, and we do ask, we do ask very, that very specific question because I want to make sure that if, if we need to do um, our materials or if we need to do something different and so I it's important for me to to know that and so we asked the question um, also the people from Guatemala m many that are coming out also speak uh, indigenous language so we asked that question as well so for example here in Oregon there is a big presence of people from Oaxaca and they speak different two dialects one is Mixteco and there is Mixteco Alto and Mixteco Bajo and so there is a there is an organization here in Oregon that that does a lot of health and safety in that in in that language so that helps a lot so again for me as uh, as a clinician is is important to to know that and um, and to record it and so that we can, if we need to do, like, let's say, a referral, for example, with that lady that I mentioned um, that did not speak uh, Spanish, 
So when I called the clinic to do the referral, I and and the paper that I sent with the patient and the and so I say does needs a, an interpreter in the language that he or she speaks. So we identify that early on. Do you know about how, how many? Oh, how many? Okay, of the um, I will say, for example, if I have a group of, uh, um, I will say it's pro it could be anywhere between you know ten to fifteen percent that is speak an, indi an indigenous language. And I think it's going to be even a little bit higher this year. I haven't studied all my data, but we've seen more individuals speaking an indigenous language. More so this year than before. Do you use community volunteers as well, or just students? Um, we do have some uh, volunteers that we sign through our, through our hospital. Yeah, the only requirement that I have is the Spanish. <laughs> that helps, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Muchas gracias.